limba cea europeană, o să ne spună Marcus mai multe. Așadar, în seama asta o să festival. De ce ne fascinează moarte și dacă și când, când poate mai puțin, mai, mai puțin probabil de spus, când, dar dacă vom ajunge pe moarte și mai ales cum? Și inclusiv în viziunea agenției situațiale europene. So, Marcus, welcome. I just made a short introduction uh, of you. Launch on the launch pad, the rocket 
rockets, the rock, these rockets are shaky, and uh, we have to make sure that nothing breaks. So, so this was tested, was launched in March uh, this year, and of course we have a couple of very interesting milestones coming up. So this was the launch um, on the 16th of uh, October. Uh, the, the satellite will separate the landing module, and the landing module will go down to the surface, and the satellite will keep searching, uh, circling the, the planet. And then on the 19th of October, you can note that in your calendar, there will be a landing on Mars by a European space probe. Now, the landing probe is very small. It's just for testing the landing itself, because the first European landing on Mars. Um, uh, the, the real mission here is the satellite that will look for trace gases in the Martian atmosphere uh, that could indicate the presence of life on, on Mars. And then there are a couple of milestones, and basically we will start to support the next mission in 2021. It's actually, the next mission will be launched in 2020. And uh, the next mission will be a rover in the ExoMars program. Well, wait a minute. This is the first picture that Mars, uh, ExoMars took from Mars. So we are approaching Mars, and you can see it's very fuzzy, right? But we are still very far away from Mars, and we are arriving only, uh, well, this has actually been taken in the summer, so now we could get back better pictures, but we're taking only science pictures when we are very close. So, so this is the first picture that was sent back just to make sure that the camera works. This picture of Mars by ExoMars, and this this is an engineering model uh, breadboard uh, of the rover that we'll plan to launch in 2020, and um, we're testing it here in, in, the, in the United Kingdom um, in, a, in, a, in a simulation. This is, like I said, it's not the real space thing. This is a model that is used on the ground to test uh, the software and, and different you know the wheels and things like that. Um, and that will launch, uh, like I said, in 2020, and we'll start exploring Mars in 2021. Uh, these are typical uh, geology instruments. Uh, there is an infrared spectrometer, there is a ground penetrating radar, there is a, um, a spectrometer for uh, a chemical spectrometer for gas chromatography. Um, so the idea is to um, characterize the geologic context of Mars at the landing site uh, and look for the suitability of that context for life. Okay, but not so much uh, on the composition. You will not analyze the composition of the rocks and so on. Well, not so much. yeah, not so much. I mean, it's mainly driven towards looking at the potential for life. That's, that's the idea. So this is ExoMars, and we're quite uh, excited about it because it's going on right now. So, like I said, in October, this thing will land, 19th of October. Um, so, let's get back to make a big jump from today's mission to once we finally start colonizing Mars. And we will use all that knowledge that we are acquiring today. What is really the problem? The biggest problem in Mars exploration is getting stuff there, whatever, astronauts, cargo, machinery, Food, propellant, anything, and every kilo to Mars costs humongous amounts of money. So this is, I show you this thing, which is a study that we had uh, 10 years ago. It's called Human Mission to Mars. And this is a monster of rock. It takes only four astronauts to Mars and back. And this, this part of the rocket is, is all the rocket stages you need to leave Earth. This bit is to arrive in Mars, and this bit is to leave Mars towards back to Earth. So you can see all of that is only rocket propellant. Only this part is this is the habitation module, and here is the, the piece that lands on Mars. Very small back here, you almost can't see it. And there is another capsule that you even cannot see it at all on this uh, scale. That that will then um, will the, allow the astronauts to go back on, on, onto Earth. So, this doesn't work. Because you would have to build a whole rocket in space and then ignite it to go to Mars. It's, this is way too expensive. This is 1,500 tons of equipment. As a comparison, the International Space Station is the most ambitious space project up to this date. Weighs 450 tons. One third, 
less than one third of this monster beast. So transportation is a huge problem. And why is this such a huge problem? Because today's chemical rockets are not efficient enough um, to, to do this. So what's the first idea to solve it? Well, if you could produce the fuel for the trip back on Mars, you don't have to bring it. And you don't have to invest extra propellant to launch that propellant, and so on and so on and so on. So, so that's the first trick. But that's not enough to make it affordable. And the, the second one is aerobraking. So you see a spacecraft going through the Martian atmosphere. Instead of arriving at Mars and braking with rocket fuel, you use the Martian atmosphere to slow you down. That is possible, but it's humongously difficult. You have to, a human could not steer this vehicle while it's going through the atmosphere. You have to have the computer making the decisions. Um, very difficult, but not undoable. If you combine in situ resource production, uh, in situ propellant production, with this, um, with this uh, aerobraking, then you could make the, the, the spacecraft much smaller and much more affordable. Um, now here comes my favorite solution. It's not very popular, but uh, that's my favorite solution. Oh, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, first, Elon. Elon solution. So he presented that today. This is the picture that he showed today in, in Mexico. Uh, so his idea is to do this, to do in situ resource uh, production and aerobraking, and combine it with a huge rocket. And his rocket is, I think it's 10,000 tons on the launch pad, it's three times as heavy as Saturn V. So he has this ultra heavy lift launch vehicle um, and he combines it with reusability. And you know that SpaceX is quite good at doing that. Um, so he wants to have this huge vehicle be reused so you can still afford it. And then he wants to add in-space refilling so he doesn't have to have all these tanks that I showed before. So he has basically only two vehicles. One is a tanker, the other is the real spacecraft. And he uses aerobraking. And he uses the most difficult kind of aerobraking, which is so-called direct aerobraking. So you go in and you try to absorb all the energy of the arrival into this uh, by braking in the Martian atmosphere, which is very cool. And beautiful, like I said. So, so that's Elon's plan. And he, he can bring 100 people to Mars with this. It's a huge rocket. I mean, it's, uh, he showed it in the presentation. If you have a chance to Google it um, and find it on YouTube, it, it's very impressive. What, what, the, the story that he tells. But that's not my favorite. Well, my favorite is nuclear rockets. Why are nuclear rockets better than chemical rockets? Uh, nuclear rockets are uh, about a factor of eight more efficient than chemical rockets. And the simple reason for that is that a chemical, any chemical reaction, if you burn hydrogen and oxygen, like you've probably done in school, has a certain limit in terms of energy density. Uh, and that's defined by, by the binding energy of the hydrogen atom. Um, if you want to be more energetic, you have to go away from chemistry. And you have to use one of the most powerful forces in nature, which is the nuclear force. And this is actually a rocket uh, that was developed uh, 40, no, wait a minute, uh, 40, no, uh, 50 years ago. Uh, it's called NERVA, and it's a nuclear rocket. It's quite simple, it's not complicated. Um, and, by the way, it's not radioactive until you switch it on. And you would only switch it on when you leave Earth, after you left Earth. Right? So you put it into space and you switch it on, and then it's radioactive. Uh, then, of course, it's not going to be the most radioactive thing out in space, because the most ra what, what's the most radioactive thing in space? The sun. The sun, right. That's a huge uh, thermonuclear reactor, right? So that's very radioactive. So, so it is much more performing. And if you combine uh, the architectures that Elon has presented with nuclear thermal propulsion, you very very quickly end up with something that is absolutely affordable, doable, and not very risky. So, so that would be my solution to the transportation problem. Here is a solution that would not work, and it's called solar electric propulsion, and some people propose it. Uh, this doesn't work. Um, it doesn't have enough thrust. It's very extremely efficient, 
but it does not have enough thrust. Uh, if you put huge solar arrays on it, like the size of the, the big park here in Budapest, uh, sorry, Bucharest, uh, then, then still you get only a couple of newtons out. But you need thousands of newtons to drive this heavy vehicle. And that doesn't work. Unless perhaps if you put it, combine it again with the nuclear band. So the next challenge is radiation. Like I said, there is a huge nuclear reactor out there, it's called the sun, and it creates radiation. Um, you should always look at radiation not always necessarily as a bad thing, could be good even. Some people go to uh, radon sources to become healthy. Um, so radiation has a health impact, and we measure that in Siebert. And um, the interesting bit is that th uh, there is one thing that is actually radioactive that you find on the market, and that's a banana. Bananas have relatively high content in potassium, and potassium has a little bit of hot isotope. So bananas are radioactive. Um, and if you stay uh, next to the Fukushima reactor that blew up a couple of years ago, and you just put your tent up there, you would receive about one banana worth per hour of radioactivity. So it's, Fukushima is not a disaster. It's, it's bad, but it's not killing anyone. If you're on, a, on, on an airplane, uh, uh, on a big jetliner, uh, you go somewhere to Europe, you receive about the same dosage that you get when you camp out next to the reactor in Fukushima. One banana per hour. Um, in the natural, depending where you are, right here, you receive about 10 bananas per day. Uh, if you have a dental x-ray, one, uh, make your teeth in an x-ray, that's 100 bananas. So that's getting a little bit hard. Uh, if you have x-ray of your chest, because you have, you have pneumonia or something, that's 1,200 bananas. Uh, that gets a bit on the, on the strange side. Well, certainly I won't eat them, but um, the radioactivity appears to be, you know, 1,000 bananas is still okay somehow because people get x-rays. So our astronauts that go on the ISS for six months, that's the equivalent of 10,000 bananas. So, so they do get a lot of radiation, but they are still healthy. So we have not lost any of our European astronauts to any cancer or anything. If you're uh, one and a half months on the moon, you receive 5,000 bananas, which is less than what people get on the ISS right now. If you are on a 180-day mission to Mars, you get 20,000 bananas. So for a space application, that's the highest value, and that's what, what the problem is. And if you use this technical version that Elon wants to use, you even get 100,000 bananas. And by the way, you die at 200,000 bananas. You get it in a short period of time. And we know that only because, because there have been nuclear weapons used in World War II, and we know from, from the statistics of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki that about 200,000 bananas kill you. So what's the solution to that? Well, this one solution is send old men. Um, this is the age, so I'm here. <laughs> uh, so I can um, I can take one, according to official NASA rules, I'm allowed to take 1.5 sievert, which is almost 200,000 bananas. Uh, in 10 years from now, I will be allowed to take three. Sieverts or 300,000 bananas uh, without being expelled from the astronaut corps. Uh, females, unfortunately, there's indeed there's a difference between females and, and males. Uh, females are more susceptible to radiation. I'm not saying that we have to do, uh, send only men to Mars. I'm, I'm not saying we have to send only old people to Mars. I'm just saying that sending older people probably reduces the problem a bit. The real solution is uh, shielding. So that's what you do in the laboratory. You use a lot of lead, you put it around, but lead is heavy. And that's, by the way, how Elon solves it. By having this huge rocket, mass is not a problem. He can take enough lead and whatever he needs to take to shield astronauts, even young girls, from, from radiation. Uh, this is a more smart way to do it. It's called a uh, bromided uh, uh, polyethylene, it's more lightweight, um, 
does the same, shields mainly against uh, neutrons, uh, it's much more lightweight. So that's what we would use these days. The third approach to solve this problem is to build the habitat so the astronaut live in the middle and all the equipment is on the outside. And the equipment and the water, tanks and everything that would basically absorb much of the radiation. But you have to be careful about that because you can even create a little bit more radiation. Uh, it's called secondaries, but uh, technically. Yeah. So there's a solution to that. Another uh, problem is shown here. It's called atrophy. So people, you know when you're uh, in, in, in bed for three weeks because you're sick, you, you, you grow very weak. And that's what happened to astronauts too in the past. And this is called atrophy. You see the very the Hercules guy goes into a wimp because his muscles are not used or her muscles are not used, and they and that creates a problem. In particular, if you're in space for for months and months. Uh, and you, of course, once you arrive on Mars, you want to still be able to do something. But that has been solved. Uh, I, I, I spare you the details, but we have a pill and a exercise regime for our astronauts. And the pill contains a lot of minerals and vitamins, and, and um, actually uh, it reduces the salt intake and everything. And our astronauts today come back stronger than when they launched. So, so that problem is solved. Yeah, that was, was a big problem for a while. Another problem is dust. Uh, this, is, this is the suit of one of the Apollo astronauts, and you've seen it full of dust. And they could never get rid of the dust, at least not in Apollo missions. And it was making problems. So hatches didn't seal, mechanisms froze up because of the dust. And even worse, on Mars, the dust is very likely to be toxic. So it's, it's, it's a poisonous dust. Um, but that is solved basically because um, we, we know today from having the moon dust on Earth um, how we should treat it and how we, what we should do with the, with the uh, space suits, with the seals, in order to avoid dust coming into the life support system. We learned that on the moon. Another challenge is that Mars is cold and dark. Um, it's one and a half to 50 percent more distant from the sun than Earth is. So the solar energy that you get is a half, um, and it's very cold. So we have to find a heat source that keeps you warm, not only you but also your computers and equipment. And yeah. so don't use a huge solar array on Mars. No, that's well you can, um, but it's very difficult. Rather use this. Uh, this is a radioisotope power source yeah. and used in Apollo. Um, it's basically a plutonium brick that emits a lot of heat, and you can turn that into electricity or you can just simply use the heat to keep things warm. Um, so that's solved as well. So we have solved that problem. Um, being away from home um, is a very interesting story. Of course, everybody knows the story of Apollo 13, right? So they flew low, they, they, they went to the moon, on the way to the moon, some really bad happened, and they were able to get back home because a very smart person came back, uh, came up with this free return trajectory, and they could just swing by the moon and come back to Earth, and a couple of days later they were safe, despite the fact that their spacecraft was actually disabled. This is not going to work on Mars. People go to Mars, um, it's going to be uh, if something really bad goes wrong, they just die. That's it. That has to be accepted. There's no solution to that problem. And it's just the acceptance of risk that would solve it. Okay, so should we talk about these things for a minute? Or so, do you have any questions? Because I'm, I'm almost done. I don't want to spend all the time. Okay, right, right, right. Okay, so, so how, how do we Lisa, uh, approach these things? We have a strategy, and there are four things that you, the strategy has to produce. Those are benefits for science, economic, global um, cooperation and inspiration. And that strategy actually feeds, this is our strategy, and that tells us um, what, which roles we should play in the program. So if, for example, NASA offers us to build a module, then we, have, we are looking at it, is that worthwhile? Is that worthwhile spending European taxpayers' money on it? So that's what the strategy does. So the partners tell us something, and uh, what we could do, and the strategy tells us whether or not we should do it. And that is informed by the, 
director general, which is uh, Jan Werner at the moment, and the council. And the council is, is the group of all member states, including Romania and every all the 22 member states. So one of these uh, roles that we found to be very exciting is the service module for the American Orion spacecraft. Uh, and I spoke about it briefly before. This is it, sitting in ESTEC in the testing chamber. And it will propel, it's the first time it will propel astronauts uh, beyond the moon. Um, and we are building it in Europe. So I believe that's a very exciting story. And here is an, another movie that I will just shut up for a minute. Come decade, we'll begin our journey back to the surface of the moon. This journey will be prepared through international cooperation and with a view to a long-term human presence beyond Earth. An early step towards sustained human exploration of the moon can be through the development of a partnership between humans on a habitat in space and near to the moon and robots working at the lunar surface to perform complex tasks, traversing challenging terrain and extracting samples. ESA is working with international partners to study a human-enhanced robotic architecture and capability for lunar <coughs> exploration and science, the Heracles architecture. With a habitat for humans already present in Sicily space, the first spacecraft in the Heracles architecture is launched towards it on board a mid-sized rocket such as the Russian built Soyuz. This spacecraft is the Heracles Ascender, which will ultimately launch from the moon surface, carrying samples to be returned to Earth. While the habitat is unoccupied, the Ascend stage arrives and is captured and attached by a robotic arm controlled by the mission control team on the ground. Next, a heavy lift launcher, such as Europe's next launch vehicle, the Ariane 6, can carry the fully fueled lander or descent stage and other heavy equipment to the outpost. This descent stage will carry the ascender and a rover to the surface of the moon from the deep space habitat. A disposable, lightweight service module precisely controls the transfer of the descent stage to the habitat. Upon arrival, the lander and ascent stage are brought together using advanced robotics controlled from the Earth. Through this, we will learn how to perform assembly operations in deep space in preparation for human missions to the lunar surface and later to Mars. After being checked out by the crew and mission control, the Heracles vehicle departs from the habitat, bound for the moon. The journey from the habitat to the moon takes two to three days. This time is used to test the operations of the mission as though it were a human mission. As the lander finally approaches the surface, its main engine has to push against lunar gravity to slow down and approach the dusty plains of the Schrodinger Basin, a huge crater on the far side of the moon. Once Heracles has touched down, the landing and operations are complete. The engine shut down, and the lander stands silently in the ancient terrain of Schrodinger, and one step closer to the next human landings. The Heracles lander contains the same elements as a human mission, the descent stage, an ascent stage, Finally, a rover. A rover is a key element for exploring the moon. It allows researchers to travel to the relevant places, cover large distances, perform in situ experiments, and collect the best possible samples. Back in the habitat, the crew are focusing on selecting lunar samples of the highest possible quality, working together with scientists on the ground. Once there is agreement on which samples are important, the task of extracting them can commence. This dexterous work can benefit from the close contact humans in the habitat have with the rover from the ground, supporting complex manual tasks. 
Martina? Ce carte e asta? Ce film, pardon? Ce film, Martina? The collective's uncles are then carefully loaded into the center and locked in place for launch back to the habitat. The unmanned launch for the lunar surface is another confidence builder for this human ascent stage, using the same basic technology but on a smaller scale. After recording the launch, the rover continues on its way, making measurements, collecting samples, and journeying on to the next Heracles landing site. The ascender arrives again at the habitat, and the samples are delivered to the waiting crew using the rover's car. The samples are brought inside and are stowed in the same capsule that the crew will use to travel back to Earth. Because the samples will return with the crew, there is no need for a separate return to Earth or a heat shield to protect the sensitive samples. The need to keep the crew in a safe environment during their return to Earth creates an environment which also allows return of high quality moon samples, which have been obtained robotically on the surface of the moon without overheating or damaging them. Humans and robots working together can prepare the next steps in space exploration, create new knowledge, and prepare the way for future human access. Right, so this is just one idea that we have uh, to start the pathway that takes us finally to Mars. Um, and it's a very concrete uh, idea. It would be the first mission in a set of then human missions, because it will simply prepare the human missions. And here is uh, some ideas where on the moon these human missions, future human missions should land. Uh, there is a bit that's called Mount Malapert, it's a mountain uh, near the south pole of the moon that actually faces Earth. And all the other landing sites, like Schrödinger was mentioned in the video, Anton Yadi, and the South Pole Aiken Basin interior are very interesting sites on the moon. And they contain information from the time when life formed on Earth that is nowhere, it's not available anywhere else in the solar system because the moon is an in Earth body that has recorded uh, uh, the environment during that time. Mars, on Mars and on Earth, this information is lost simply because of the dynamical environment on the surface. So let me close my talk with this inspirational image that shows the, the path that we are taking in ESA today leads us first to human moon missions. And of course, the human moon missions give us a very credible perspective to have humans on Mars in the not too distant future. And I'm convinced that today, People who will land on the Mars are in elementary school or uh, even in middle school today. So the person that will make the first footsteps on Mars lives today, uh, just doesn't know it yet. So thank you very much for, for your attention and let's uh, talk about that for a minute. That's an absolute valid question. It's one of the most important questions that we should ask. Because um, as we are here in the room, we cannot go to Mars very likely. Well, some of you can. Um, but what's in it for you? And I believe it's what, what's in it for you is that uh, the world is better if we try to get to Mars. Because um, innovation will create uh, an economy that is better better paid jobs, uh, less um, of this, I mean, I'm from the West, right, so <laughs> so the word capitalism is, is, is used in most of the time in a very positive sense, but there's also this dark side of capitalism. If you have this competition between companies that are pushing against each other and they only improve their, their performance by lowering the salaries for their employees, and I think that's very bad. And, and everybody is suffering from it. And you see that happening today with uh, companies like Uber or 
they just try to lower the salaries because they are not innovating. And if you innovate, if you have a product as a company that is your, and, and you're the first to offer it, you don't have a competition. You can't pay your people, your, your employees, a good salary. So that's one benefit. And there, there are many others I can comment. So uh, going to Mars and also to the moon is, is a, how to say, it's a, a very <coughs> challenging yeah, goal. And this will make us be more creative, more innovative, more, I don't know, test our limits in terms of what? Of mental capabilities, technical capabilities? Uh, mental capabilities, yes. So it will bring out the best in us. So what, what we are all the smarts in us. Uh, so smart people will be rewarded with better jobs, and, and not so smart people will be uh, get an incentive to become smarter, and and that's very positive. And the other thing I believe is um, the culture. I mean, we're seeing times like at the beginning of my talk where there's only fear. You know, people spend money on fences in southern Europe. People spend money on even more security at airports. Which has its rights, but but it's not very productive. So so I believe this culture of exploration creates a society that's much better to live in. Okay, so well, we will take uh, questions in a short time, but I would just want to um, to touch a few things with you. Uh, it was a very nice idea, you know, in your first movie. Uh, we can because we've done it before, so that was the message. But we didn't do Mars before, so how do we know that we can do Mars? And I, I'm convinced that that the challenges that I showed, some don't have a solution yet, but many have. Right? So, so like I said, uh, the muscle atrophy problem has been solved. The transportation problem has not been solved so far. I mean, Elon today presented a very attractive solution which is a bit on the risky side. And one part of his solution he didn't say, which is, yeah, we accept more risk, right? So that would be part of the solution. So looking at the whole problem of getting to Mars, I think we're today much further than we were 10 years ago. And do you, um, do you think, OK, let's, let's uh, say agree that finally we humans will land on Mars. But um, what's the best kind of mission, in your opinion? Unmanned, robotic, manned, combined missions for going to Mars? Uh, th that's an interesting discussion because it took place over a long time. So let me start by saying I'm convinced that robots will never replace humans. Absolutely convinced of that. That's a good uh, message. Right, I think it's a good message, uh, also here on Earth. Uh, just look at how... how uh, Car companies are struggling to make a very simple task, which is driving a car, automatic. And they use huge computers to make it. And of course, you can never have these huge computers on board a rocket. So having said that, I believe also robots have their place in space. The biggest robot today in space is on board the space station. It's the Canadian robotic arm. It's a, it's a 500 kilo robot. And I believe this approach of having robots helping humans is the right uh, is is the right way to use robots in space. Robots without humans, I mean, there have been people saying that yeah, we just send a rover and it will fax back to us a scientific paper that we can publish in Nature. That that is just you know this focus that never will happen. But uh, won't be safer to send uh, first of all a, a robot to step on on, on Mars. And to prepare everything for us humans to go there? Yeah, you already did that. So, so yes, uh, it would, well, it depends on what you mean by safe. If you mean safe for the astronauts, I don't think that counts because astronauts, they, they sign up for a risk. No, it's safe for us humans who are dreaming to move to Mars. Yes. I, I don't think it's safer. It's just, uh, it's, it's a, um, the, the advantage of sending smaller missions first is that you don't have to ask your stakeholders for a huge amount of money right away. You start with a smaller amount of money and you start increasing it because the missions must become more ambitious. Uh, by the way, there was uh, the, the, the project scientist of the Burr rovers, the, the Opportunity and Curiosity rovers, said that 
And he was asked, why are all the robotic missions so expensive today? I mean, they're talking about 8 billion euros for the, for the next Mars mission. <coughs> and, and why is it so expensive? And he said, it's quite simple. All the easy stuff that is worthwhile studying on Mars has already been done. And the complex stuff, you either need a human that is smart and make decisions on the surface, or a very complex robot, which is complicated, which also needs a life support system. So in the end, it's better to send a human if, you, if your mission is very complex. OK, uh, speaking about money and about uh, Elon Musk, who already proved that he can do things, um, do, you, do you think, do you see for the future um, this partnership, public-private partnership, being the solution for space exploration, for Mars exploration? I, I believe I see it um, in, in an interesting way. So yes, I think public-private partnership is key, but must not be abused because. In what way? So of course, you, as a private company, I could use the public-private partnership to get as money, as much money as possible out of the public system, and, and there are companies who have tried that. So, so there must be very strict rules, and one rule is that the. the the public taxpayer is not the only customer. There must be other customers in the, in the mix. And I'm convinced that that applies mainly to lower orbits, where there's, uh, there is a business case to be made, like creating medical uh, new drugs, uh, creating new materials, uh, where industry has a market. So in low Earth orbit, this is I think this is an easy sell, and, and Elon Musk already pro provides his product for low Earth orbit. For Moon and Mars, it's much more difficult. I was just thinking about the way uh, the, the fact that um, uh, private companies are moving faster than public organizations. Yes, ESA has to cannot the, the general director of ESA cannot say, okay, I want to do this, we'll do this. It has to be a consultation, takes time. So maybe this combination can short you know, time to reach. Yes. So that's one of the weaknesses. You, you put the finger in the problem. That's the weakness of space agencies. We take too much time to decide. And that, but that's but, just but it's, it's normal because it's public money. Yes. It's not one country, it's 20, 22. 22. Yeah. Okay. So that's the problem. Uh, just a short break. Uh, ESA had rec very recently a public consultation, the yes. first public consultation. Do you think that this can be a solution for the future projects at space agency? Should that work? Yes. I'm absolutely, I, the idea is brilliant to have the taxpayers speak, speaking directly to ESA. And the reason I believe that is so important is that normally as ESA we have only contact with ministers and politicians. Which is good because we live in a representative democracy and they should represent the people, right? But sometimes they get a bit detached, right? So, so it's always good for us as a space agency to talk directly to the citizen and, and get inspired. So get the input. That what does what do the citizens want from ESA? And uh, I can promise you, we just received this input, and before the ministerial council. ESA will take a very close look at what was said here in, in Bucharest and in Darmstadt and in everywhere in, in each of the 22 member states. We made an event like that on the same day and we will very closely look at the results. It was very interesting because in Bucharest there were around 200 and something people, so people are very interested in, in, in the field but also in uh, making their voices you know, heard. Uh, just two more ideas and then we can take questions from the public. I was, uh, I don't know if this is a crazy uh, question, but I didn't see many, many people talking about the contamination. Mm -hmm. So we are going to Mars, we are coming, we are, we are going in space, we are coming back. Cross contamination, yeah. how do you deal with this? Okay. Uh, that's an interesting question because it's called planetary protection, and there's um, there's even international fora in which this is discussed in the frame of COSPA. There's a there's a section on planetary protection, and we take it very seriously. Um, we sterilize all spacecraft that we send to Mars. We make sure that samples that come back from Mars uh, don't have a direct link to Earth. There are some technical details here that are very intricate. Um, I give you one. 
That is, for example, if we send a sample back, uh, it's never targeted directly uh, at Earth until there's a positive identification of no possibility of contamination. So until there's a sealing mechanism, and until this me the sealing mechanism says 100% sure there's no uh, biologic uh, that sample that can get, get out, this, this probe will, in the nominal case, go by Earth, but only if we have a proof that this is okay, then it will be directed towards Earth. Okay, and now uh, a little bit more philosophical approach. So this uh, this new stage of space exploration, do you think that this will, uh, in one hand, change a little bit uh, the relationship between states? There is no more, you know, fight between the USA and Russia. Uh, and on the other hand, do you see this new stage of space exploration as a, how to say, as a, as a chance for smaller nations? to step into space exploration? Both, uh, on both questions, I would say yes. Um, first of all, space always builds bridges. And i just tell you an interesting story. That Two years ago, I was in, in Strasbourg at the meeting of the international partners talking about space exploration. And uh, we were hosting it as Europeans in Strasbourg. And um, I, I had the task to put the seats there. So, um, so I put the Ukrainian guy as much far from the Russian guy as I could, because that two years ago, remember? Uh, so, and then I was in the room, I was nervous because it was my, my event, and the Russian, the, the, the Boris was sitting there, the, the Ukrainian guy, a very nice guy, and then the Russian guy came in, and they looked at each other, and the first thing they did, they hugged. They have, of course, they know each other since 30 years, and they are friends, old friends in the same field. They don't care what their ministers and their presidents say. They're just friends. And, and that's what space has always been. It's always a bridge of people, um, and that will continue. But the new dimension, I believe, is that now it's becoming more diverse. Uh, there is more countries, there is more uh, intercultural things, and it's growing again. So it will become more important. It will never be the final solution for peace, uh, because space is just, as, a, as an activity, is too small. There will always be conflicts that you cannot solve by, by the space people. But the space people is a group that just, they know each other. Uh, the astronauts know each, know each other, the engineers know each other, so. It can be an example of cooperation yes. and understanding. And, uh, uh, speaking about small nations, um, also this, uh, this Congress, which is now held in Guadalajara in Mexico, mm -hmm. the International Astronautical Congress, is a kind of example that Me Mexico is not a, a superpower in space, but it has a space agency, and holding such a conference can be a chance, and participating in projects can be a chance. So. Okay, uh, you never, you, you didn't say anything about the space station, what would happen? Uh, so, so right now, uh, we Europeans are the last one to extend it to 24, 2024, and we plan to do that. We propose it to the, our member states, and it looks good, so we'll probably do that. Um, and the, the approach is to make it more affordable, spend less taxpayer money on it, and slowly but surely hand it over to the private sector and let them offer their services, uh, like SpaceX and um, uh, all these nice companies can start providing services to industrial partners. Will we have an, a, another space station, international kind of space station? That, that's not ruled out. I would not rule that out. If the ISS infrastructure as it is today would not serve that function. And then there's also the China space station, right? It was launched recently. And we are already, our ESA astronauts are already training with the Chinese astronauts together to send the European astronauts to the China space station. So it will become more colorful up in the lower level. Okay, uh, there are many other questions I would have left, but I would like the public the audience to ask questions. <coughs> Thank you for the presentation, Mar Marcus. Is there any place for the lunar elevator in this complex equation, in your opinion? Yeah, the lunar elevator, let me explain really quick. Uh, of course, not everybody knows about it. So the lunar elevator is an idea to connect lunar orbit to the lunar surface with a cable. Sounds a bit radical, a bit crazy, but it is feasible. 
And I believe the lunar elevator is a key element to have an affordable connection between lunar orbit and lunar surface. But it's going to be once we have more need to send things up and down, then we will need. I think it's a natural thing to build the elevator. It's it's, it's unavoidable. Uh, it's only not the first step. It's the second step. Um, and there is certainly a role of the elevator. And then you can ride up and down on an elevator from space down to the lunar surface. It's a beautiful idea. So my question regarding all the uh, space exploration teams out there. So uh, do you from the ESA benefit from the shared amounts of data uh, from the NASA or SpaceX? And do they benefit from your data? Uh, depends on what data you mean. Normally, uh, much much of the, uh, in the ISS program, for example, uh, we share all data. So if there is a test on a Russian astronaut performed by a NASA team, that data is available to everybody. There are some things that are not available, like the like patents of SpaceX for reusability. Uh, so the vehicles are excluded from that. But in general, it's quite open. Um, and there's even open source agreements in space exploration. Oh, I mean, you said something about the rover as to be sent to from here to Mars, and I know that uh, it is another rover from NASA there. Yeah. And you benefit from the shared that data from Mars. <laughs> if you say you and mean ESA, no. Yeah. Yeah. If you say you and mean Europe, yes, because there are, there are European PIs, and, and there's a there's the PDS, the Planetary Data System, and you can get the data after the PI that is associated with that instrument had a first look. And they even limit it to only six months. So after six months, they have to yes. put it in the PDS, and it's publicly available. Um, <coughs> but we don't, as ESA, don't play a PI role in American missions uh, and the other way around. So it's a bit of a touchy topic recently in, in, in uh, ESA to be very open about it. Because we have a wonderful Rosetta mission, which is great. I think it's one of the greatest achievements of Europe. And the PI kept the pictures for one year, and that's not okay, I believe. If you have if you have a taxpayer paid mission, the taxpayer has the right to see these images after two weeks of processing them, you know, perhaps, but not after a year. And in Europe, we have to improve the situation. Yes. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, coming back to Elon Musk and SpaceX, if you don't mind, <laughs> uh, if there has been a step from either side to actually cooperate and refine the ideas of in the process of going to Mars, because even in the case of Elon Musk, who doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, go to all these bureaucratic procedures, this is a huge undertaking, I and mean, it's probably the biggest one that has ever been, uh, been taken on by mankind. So basically, has there been any step from each side to refine the ideas? Because there are, I saw a lot of common points. Is there are breaking and some other stuff in situ yeah. resource production that you mentioned, and maybe there there can be some kind of let's say brainstorming <laughs> session that can refine some of the ideas. Thanks for the question. Uh, what what combines this is physics. So the laws of physics are the same for Elon, even even though he's million, a billionaire, right? So if billionaires have to obey to the law of physics. But Elon has not approached anybody, and I believe he knows it all. And it's not that difficult. The equations are not that difficult, and he knows it. You don't have to tell him how to do things. Um, and, and we actually take his ideas on our side. We know why you cannot, as ESA, can do the same thing that Elon can, because we cannot take the same risks. Uh, we, we have stakeholders that want answers and they want benefits earlier than, than after 20 years and so on. Um, but there's surprisingly little combination between the two programs. There's also this Mars uh, 2018, the Red Dragon mission, and we're not cooperating. Not because we don't want to, but because SpaceX doesn't want to. They want to do it, they want to show that they can do it. And if we would introduce ourselves as ESA or even NASA, that NASA would, yeah, 
if we help you, then the message would get lost that the private sector alone can put something like that uh, in. Just a small remark on, it is a big undertaking, but I know a bigger one. It's called World War II. World War II was so humongously expensive, you can build thousands of rockets like that. Um, and people still do war. And they think they get a bad benefit out of it. And at the end, everything is in shrapnel and in, 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 in pieces and no benefit. And on the contrary, there's disease and poverty. So, so as a global community, we should make the choice and say, yes, let's, instead of doing the next world war whatever, let's, let's do the Mars mission. And then, then all of a sudden, if the money is there, then all the other problems are solved. Hello, thanks for the presentation. Uh, question about uh, rockets. Uh, I read that Airbus and the Ariane Space are merging, so that means Europeans are looking to have their own... Uh, they already have, but... Uh, they want more rockets and their own rockets to send astronauts. What's the plan with that? Right, so right now we don't have a rocket for astronauts. We don't have manned launch capability. And we're relying on Russia uh, to, to give us rides on the Soyuz, like the Americans do right now, um, to take astronauts to space. In the near future, I expect that we have European astronauts also on SLS and Orion. Like I said, we have a cooperation. And we'll have, hopefully, seats on SpaceX Dragon crew vehicles. Um, right now, there is no plan to build a European launcher for astronauts. Ariane's bus and, um, and Airbus, or now it's called Airbus Safran, um, they are growing together for another reason. They want, um, they want a bigger decision-making potential on the industry side, because they want to market the rocket. They want to become a little bit more like SpaceX, a little bit less like a, like a state-driven company. And if that works out, I don't know. Um, there's a bit of a risk, but we will develop in that framework Ariane 6, which will look quite similar to Ariane 5, will be as powerful. And um, you have seen Ariane 6 in one of the videos. And uh, let's see where we get with this new approach. But unfortunately, for now, no astronauts from European soil. Thank you very much. Why is it never used, being used? Because I've seen from, from your side that it's ready from the 70s, from the 60s. Why aren't we using nuclear rockets? Um, well, the reason why it was cancelled was it was cancelled in the frame of the Nixon cancellation of the Apollo program. Right? So, so Nixon just took a red and cancel it all, including the nuclear program. Um, it is, the plans are still, they still exist, so we could start not from zero, but from some level of knowledge, but it would still be expensive. And that's one of the well hidden secrets about Mars exploration, is that if you say you want to go to Mars without going by the moon, the first thing you have to do today is to invest in the nuclear program. And it, it's a bit of money, I mean, it's not zero, right? We're talking about five to ten billion euros. And, and nobody's ready to put that kind of money on the table. Uh, so the moon, with astronauts, is a way to make it cheaper, make the first steps a little bit cheaper, and prepare other things, and perhaps use, once you're at the moon, it's, it's simpler to introduce a nuclear rocket because it's far away and you know, people not are as afraid. And, and perhaps you can even use lunar water to fill your tanks. Uh, we all heard about the Mars One program. How, let's say, um, unfeasible is that project actually? Because it 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 has a lot of good ideas. I mean, uh, it proposes a lot of uh, ideas, but there is no no really backing. Of the, of the program. So, so let me say that. So the only thing, positive thing I can say about Mars 1 is it has proven that there's a huge part of the European public, of, of the world public, that is interested in space exploration. There are even people who are ready to give their lives for it. So, so it must be interesting, right? So on the negative side, there's absolutely no reason not to come back. If you use in situ resource utilization, 
the return trip is almost for free. It's 20 or 25% of the overall program cost. And it's unethical. You can never explain to a human what it means to go to another planet and stay there. So this, this human, even if he say, or she says, yes, I want to die on Mars, he or she would not know what that means. So there is no ethical way to, of doing it. So, so don't. Um, there is this new field in biochemistry called synthetic biology, in which bacteria are engineered to produce various fuels or materials in a much cheaper way than uh, uh, usual chemical synthesis. And I know that NASA has special programs dedicated to this new field, and that in Europe there, are, there is a lot of new funding. Uh, for uh, new startups and for universities. Does the European Space Agency have some current or future plans regarding this new field? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, and the reason is not, not because we're not interested. The reason is that we have very clear um, uh, borderlines between the ESA research program and the EU research program, which is, as you know, the Horizon 2020. And the EU if we get a proposal from you saying, I want to do research in synthetic biology, uh, you demands that we send that proposal to the EU and they will provide the funding. Uh, it's simply there's a set of rules that they want to have a certain share in that and, and we're doing other things. But synthetic biology is very interesting. In particular, uh, also, uh, we still don't understand how prebiotic pre pre evolution took place on Earth. right? And then, Synthetic biology teaches us a lot about uh, how you can, how non-living things can turn into living things. So, so it's not only for, for the production and technology side of things, but also the fundamental understanding of life. And in that bit we are interested, because then we are start, starting to build payloads to detect life. And that would be an ESA job. Yeah, well, I expect that in the future when we plan to actually make colonies uh, right. on Mars, it, yeah. it might be more, let's say, useful, this uh, technical, synthetic biology approach. Yes, research. yes. For example, if you talk about the synthetic biology life support system, yes. and of course you know about the Melissa project, it has a couple of biology uh, elements in it. It's a, it's a regenerative life support system for Mars. But it's gearing towards nearer term, so that's the first, say, 10 Mars missions. So, so uh, yes, we are interested, but for now, these colonized Mars ideas, research, that goes rather into the EU program, and we're talking to the EU every day, basically. If they have a project and results that are interesting for us, they tell us.